There is something legendary about the crimes that took place before smartphones were so commonly available and before cameras were installed everywhere. Before the times of these safety measures were the incidents that caused the safety measures to be necessary. This is especially true when you take the story of D.B. Cooper into consideration. A story greater than anything Hollywood could have thought of, the notorious crime stays in the minds of crime enthusiasts even now, a half century later. This tale involves a bomb threat, a plane hijacking, and one of the most thrilling escapes in recorded history. It's a crime that remains unsolved to this day. With no conclusive ending or close to this crime of the millennia, what is there to know about the infamous acts of D.B. Cooper? It was the day before Thanksgiving, the year was 1971. It was undoubtedly supposed to be a routine flight for the flight crew. Some people were likely traveling to visit family for the holidays, and a short flight to the next state over didn't seem to spell disaster. There were 36 passengers recorded for that flight, which was set to take off on the afternoon of November 24th. These 36 passengers did not include the flight crew, which consisted of the pilot, an airplane mechanic, a first officer, and two flight attendants. Passengers were boarding onto this flight, flight number 305, at the Portland International Airport in Portland, Oregon. Amongst the passengers boarding the plane was a man, described as being in his mid-40s. The man was unassuming enough, lacking a unique or particular accent of any kind. The most notable part of this man was his outfit. He is recorded to have been wearing a dark suit and tie. He was quiet and didn't raise much of an alarm for any of the people around him, traveling with a lone briefcase. The ticket the man purchased was one way and cost $20, or a modern day equivalent of about $135. He was seated in an aisle labeled 18C. As the plane took off, no one could have known what was about to come. In the briefcase of the unassuming man was a mess of wires, and on his mind was a diabolical plan the world had yet to see. The only name gathered amongst the flurry of his actions and the aftermath would go down in history, Dan D.B. Cooper. It was shortly after takeoff when Cooper grabbed the attention of one of the flight attendants. The flight attendant's name was Florence Schaffner, age 23 at the time. When she came to tend to Cooper, he gave her a slip of paper. Reportedly, it was common for men who were traveling alone during these times to slip stewardesses' phone numbers or hotel information. Assuming it was another form of unreciprocated interest, Schaffner picked up the slip of paper but continued with her duties. It would be shortly after this, the next time she was passing by Cooper, that the terrifying truth of the situation would become apparent. Cooper grabbed her attention once more and beckoned her closer. When she was close enough, he quietly told her she needed to read the note and indicated his briefcase contained a bomb. Stunned, Schaffner read the message, which told her to sit next to him and reiterated his possession of a bomb. Cooper moved to the window seat of the row and Schaffner sat beside him in the aisle seat. Showing her the briefcase, which was filled with wires, red sticks, and a battery, he told her he wanted her to write down his demands. Doing as she was told, Schaffner wrote down Cooper's demands of four parachutes and $200,000 in $20 bills. He wanted these things to be delivered when the plane landed in Seattle. If the demands were not met, he threatened to blow up the plane and kill all of those on board. Going to the pilot and allowing him to read the note, air traffic control was immediately contacted about the terrorist situation. Air traffic control was just as quick to call Seattle police, who phoned the FBI. It was a short matter of time before the airline's president was being called. The president of Northwest Orient Airlines, Donald Nyrup, quickly advised Cooper's demands be met as promptly as possible. When Schaffner returned to let Cooper know his demands were being met, he advised that she return the note, which she did. Unfortunately, because of this, the exact wording of the note is unknown. After this, Cooper instructed Schaffner to tell the pilot to stay in the air until the money and parachutes were ready. Acquiring the items was difficult, as Cooper was very precise about how he wanted the items given to him. He made sure to specify he wanted bills that were not sequential, but instead random, making it more challenging to track future usage. These requests were followed, but it was confirmed each bill started with the letter L in its serial code. The parachute request was more difficult than the money to abide by. As military parachutes were offered first, but were quickly declined by Cooper, Cooper wanted civilian parachutes and wanted four of them, leading officials to believe he planned on taking an airborne hostage. They had the thought of giving him rigged parachutes, but didn't want to risk the lives of innocent people who may be taken hostage by the criminal. When Cooper's demands were prepared, further instructions were given to those who planned on delivering the material needs. For example, a car was to drive to the plane, and whoever delivered the items must come unaccompanied. These demands were met, and Tyne Mucklow, the second flight attendant, was instructed to get the things. When she reboarded the plane, Cooper released the other passengers and Florence Schaffner, but kept Mucklow and the three other male airline employees. Once the plane was refueled, Cooper ordered the plane to take off on a course to Mexico City. However, he had very specific requests for how the aircraft, a Boeing 727-100, should fly. 
Cooper ordered the plane to stay below an altitude of 10,000 feet and keep airspeed below 150 knots. Cooper also advised the pilot to depressurize the plane cabin. When the pilot told Cooper that he wouldn't be able to make it to Mexico City with his flying instructions on the gas capability of the plane, it was agreed the plane would make a stop in Reno, Nevada for a mid-trip fuel stop. After all these details had been figured out, the aircraft was off the ground by 7.46 p.m. When the plane was officially in the air, Cooper ordered the crew into the cockpit with the doors closed. At this time, the cockpit door had no peephole, and there were no cameras installed in the plane for the crew to watch. They were trapped in the cockpit with no way of knowing just what Cooper was doing. It was 14 minutes after takeoff that a light on the plane's monitor indicated an open door. Over the intercom from the cockpit, the pilot asked if Cooper needed assistance or if the crew could do anything for him. This seemed to irritate Cooper, who responded with a loud and angry, No! This short and straightforward word would be the last known word of D.B. Cooper. 24 minutes after this, the jet dipped and recorrected itself, and the pilot made sure to note the spot the dip occurred. While it was assumed at this point Cooper had jumped from the plane, none of the crew wanted to risk death by defying his orders. It would be when they landed in Reno, Nevada, almost two hours later, that they confirmed the passenger area of the plane was empty. D.B. Cooper was gone. Things seemed to have worked out in Cooper's favor that evening. Whether it be by coincidence, or because he did his research beforehand, we'll never know. The plan was originally for the plane to be followed by military jets to keep an eye out for anyone who jumped. However, this ended up not being possible because of the slow speeds the Boeing was traveling at. With jets capable of high speeds, they proved useless in this chase. By the time more appropriate aircrafts were found to follow and officials caught up, Cooper had already jumped. The weather following this crime made it near impossible for officials to search that evening and night. The visibility and safety issues brought by the weather led officials to delay searching until the next day. When the weather was finally calmed, the search began. And search they did. That Thanksgiving, and for several weeks after, extensive searches were performed of the area in hopes of finding any clues which would lead them to solve the case. However, this would not happen. All traces of the hijacker, the money, and the parachute were all gone. They had all successfully vanished. In the subsequent searches for a man who fit the description and name of the criminal, police stumbled across the record of an Oregon man named D.B. Cooper. The discovery of this man led one reporter claiming the man to be the criminal, which was repeated, thus becoming the legend of D.B. Cooper. Before the spread of misinformation, the man was simply known as Dan Cooper. However, it has been determined since then that the name was more likely a fake to begin with. The only evidence to have ever been found in regards to the hijacking of Northwest Orient Airlines Flight 305 occurred in February of 1980. About eight years and some change after the crime, a boy stumbled across bundles of $20 bills. The serial numbers listed on the bills matched the listed serial codes given to Cooper. The boy, who was eight years old, found them in the Columbia River. New searches were held in that area, but if any evidence remained, it was likely destroyed with the eruption of Mount St. Helen in May of 1980. The discovery of these dollars has led many to believe that Cooper did not survive his skydiving escape. If he had made it alive, certainly he wouldn't have misplaced such large amounts of money along the way. Not to mention, the beginning of winter in the American Northwest is nothing to take lightly. Others aren't so sure, though. Over the half-century of time between the crime and modern day, many people have come forward claiming to be D.B. Cooper. Just as many have come forward to claim D.B. Cooper was a relative of theirs. The FBI had taken some time to investigate some of these claims, but none of them ever led to anything. As a result, it would be 2016, almost 45 years after the crime was committed, that the FBI announced they would no longer be putting resources into the search of D.B. Cooper. The FBI also went on to clarify that this case closing does not mean that the case was solved. D.B. Cooper's identity has remained a mystery to this day, and will likely always remain a mystery. Whether or not he survived his jump will likely forever remain a mystery, and will always be amongst the first tales told when someone asks about the craziest true crime tale to date. Dan D.B. Cooper is forever cemented in American history. What do you think of the story of D.B. Cooper? Are you surprised that a case like this has remained unsolved for so long? Do you believe D.B. Cooper survived his jump from the plane? Or do you, like many others, believe the cash found in the Columbia River is a sure sign the man didn't make it? Whatever thoughts you may have, leave them down in the comments below. If you have any recommendations for true crime topics you'd like to hear covered, recommend them down below. Until next time, remember to subscribe to stay up to date with our true crime content. Stay safe.